different thing. All right, here we go. Um, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great day. Thank you for joining us, uh, Suzanne and I today. We're going to be talking about uh, gardening for the good bugs today. And thank you to our sponsor host today, the Clean Water Program of Alameda County. Tonight, we'll probably talk for close to an hour, hopefully a little less. We'll have space for questions at the end. Um, feel free to always uh, plug in your questions in the Q&A or the chat, and we can um, you know, answer as we go. And then, of course, the, we can answer at the end as well. We will, as always, give an uh, introduction to the Our Water, Our World program, talk about integrated pest management, We'll talk a lot about some specific good bugs in the garden that you'll see commonly in your garden, why we want them around, and how to keep them around. And today we are brought to you by the Clean Water Program of Alameda County, which works to protect Alameda County creeks, wetlands, and the bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. Related to gardening, that means avoiding chemicals that can be washed off the lawn and garden and into the storm drains by irrigation and rain. You can learn more at cleanwaterprogram.org. Um, and to learn more also, you can sign up for a, the newsletter at cleanwaterprogram.org. Uh, if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get uh, you know, events, including webinars like this and other in-person events and just information about healthy gardening and keeping our waterways clean. And um, it sounds like many of you have been to webinars with us before. So um, thank you. Thank you for coming back over and over. We appreciate it. Um, but anyone who would like to review or is new to the webinars can actually see all of our past webinars, which there are several. Um, uh, at the Clean Water Program of Alameda County YouTube channel. Um, lots of different topics from soil to drought to veggie gardening to healthy roses. Um, we cover a lot of different topics. Um, so feel free to go back over those and uh, learn more about specific topics. And um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, what is the Our Water, Our World program? It is a national award-winning clean water program. The goal is to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality by sharing how many of the products we use around the home and garden that can end up polluting our local waterways. We partner with uh, water pre pollution prevention agencies and retailers that sell pesticides. Um, and we provide this IPM education to the retail associates and to you, the, the public, around effective, less toxic pest management. In many of our stores, you can see the, the stores that we partner with, you can see um, a fact sheet rack uh, with handouts about common pest problems. Some, some also have QR code posters. You can just scan, get the information right on your phone. And uh, many stores also have these blue tags on the shelf that will highlight the less toxic products on the shelves. Um, you can learn about all of the, you can see all the fact sheets and learn more about water quality and less toxic products at the website, ourwaterourworld.org. Now, uh, so we're talking about pesticides, we're talking about water. What is the, the, the connection there? Well, uh, there is a direct connection actually. Um, first, we all live, uh, first actually I'll share what a watershed is. We all live in, if you live in Alameda County, or San Francisco and other surrounding counties, you live in the uh, San Francisco Bay watershed, which is massive. Half of all the water that lands on the state of California drains uh, you know, through the mountain, down from the mountains, through the Delta, uh, through the Central Valley, and it drains into the San Francisco Bay. And as it moves through those um, areas, anything, any water that's not absorbed into the soil that moves, you know, over the soil or over, uh, you know, streets and, and concrete, uh, picks up material along the way, enters storm drains, or goes directly into waterways, and it gathers all into the bay. 
Um, so you can imagine all of the material that it picks up along the way from pesticides and fertilizers, also motor oil, pet waste, debris, litter. Uh, I see a lot of masks on the street and they pick those up and bring them into the waterways. Um, so all of that collects into the bay. And so we really wanna reduce um, the pollutants that get into our waterways, not just pesticides and fertilizers, but everything, everything we're doing out in the uh, in our yards, on the street, just out in the world, does have a direct line to our waterways through storm drains because there is no filtration. Any water, any material that enters the storm drains at the street level does go directly to a waterway. So hopefully we can um, think about that while we're outside doing our thing outside and be more conscious of keeping um, some toxic materials and other debris out of the storm drains and out of the waterways. And one way we can do this in the garden is by practicing integrated pest management. If we ever have pests that we're dealing with, uh, this um, strategy, <laughs> integrated pest management, is um, a way of looking at the garden more holistically, kind of a big picture view of the garden. Um, and we use science-based strategies when we're implementing um, certain uh, tactics. Uh, we're going to take a big step back, look at the garden as a whole, ask a lot of questions. What really is the problem at hand? A lot of times when we see problems in the garden, um, they may not be pests. They could be an environmental thing, something with our watering, something with our fertilizing, maybe sunburn or frost damage. We're seeing both hot sun and cold nights, so it could be one of those. Um, so lots of different things out in the world, not just pests, cause problems in our garden. So let's figure out what's really going on. Can we identify the problem? And then if it is a pest, of course, we're gonna identify it. And can we live with it? That's a good question to ask yourself. What's the level that this problem becomes so bad that I need to take action? Um, or is it just a nuisance? Is it gonna go away quickly? Uh, you know, Can I fix it with a quick little squish or a, a washing of our plant? Or do I need to take action? And then, um, so the steps of uh, integrated pest management are on the right. Identification, as I mentioned, is really important. Is it a pest or is it something else? And if it is a pest, what pests are we dealing with? At? And now we'll talk about more today, why that's so important. Prevention, it includes, you know, just keeping a healthy garden, planting the right plants, taking good care of them, um, maybe using some physical barriers in the garden to prevent um, unwanted pests. Uh, very important to get ahead of them. It will lessen any issues that come up. And then when we have a problem and we do want to take action, there are four kinds of uh, action steps in integrated pest management called controls. The first one is cultural controls, uh, which is really focusing on bolstering the health of the environment and health of the garden. A lot of what we'll talk about today. Um, actually, yeah, well, we always talk about it, <laughs> about cultural controls, making the environment really beneficial to our plants, to our garden ecosystem will really uh, create a good environment for that those plants, but a, a less desirable environment for pests. That's kind of a lot of what cultural controls is, is changing the environment to benefit us and our plants and uh, less adding less benefit for our pests, make them want to go somewhere else. Then we have mechanical controls, which are physical things that we can use, traps, barriers, and tools biological controls, which is really what we're going to talk about today. That is our main focus, using the living, living organisms to manage pests. And then we will touch a little bit on chemical controls, which are pesticides, which we always use as a last resort in integrated pest management. So as I mentioned, we are going to you talk today mostly about biological controls, but kind of understanding um, IPM as a whole, we want to focus on identification. We're going to set up our gardens for success. We're going to grow biodiversity and we're going to reduce or completely avoid pesticide usage. And wow, what an amazing photo. We got, we have multiple stages of life uh, of the ladybugs on that one photo. That's I know it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, now this is when the fun starts. We hope you're ready. Hope you're ready for this. Uh, we created this little game 
that uh, it's going to be short, so don't panic. It's not going to involve too much, but uh, we're here to test your knowledge. The game is called Squish or Don't Squish. We hope you are ready. Wait a minute, I'm not ready. I'm the one that's not ready. <laughs> All right, to play this game, we're gonna show you some pictures of some common insects you'll see in the garden. And if we, we're gonna ask squish or don't squish. If you want to squish it, you're gonna click raise hand like you're gonna squish the bug, uh, which you can find between the chat button and the Q&A button. Hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, so you're gonna, if we say squish, we're gonna hit the raise hand button. And then uh, once we're done, we're gonna move to the next slide. You can lower, it'll give you the option to lower your hand. So we'll lower our hand before yeah. the next slide. And it might lower on its own as we advance the slides too. I don't remember, but um, it's pretty simple. If anyone's having any um, issues, you can type it into the chat, but uh, we hope you're ready. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, there's Sorry about that. Okay, yeah. great. Lower your yeah. hand, Suzanne. <laughs> All right, okay. so are we going to squish this one? Let's see. I see some squishers on the. Are we squishing this one? Squishing. Squish or don't squish? What do we think? We got a couple squishers. Some people kind of said yes and then backed out again. All right. I see. I see. Okay, I finally got there. Okay, right, right. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, squish. Excellent. All right. What about this creepy crawler? Lower your hand. Now we're going to try this one. What do we think about squishing this one? We're gonna squish, yeah, squish it. Squish. It's creepy. Look at all those spines. Look at <laughs> it's like what even is that? So oh weird. my gosh, I don't got know. ten people want to squish that one. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're Lower your hands, and we'll try again. <laughs> we're gonna go to the next one now. All right. What? Ugh, oh, yucky. Are we gonna squish this one? Are we squishing creepy. this one? Yeah, we're squishing this one, right? I would <laughs> I see a lot of people it. are going to squish this one. I would totally squish this one. All right. Okay, okay. All right, super. All right, now we're going to we're just have one more. We have one more. Oh, my gosh. Oh. What the heck is this? Are we going to squish this? I've never seen that in real life. That is, <laughs> I'm crazy. glad I haven't. I would squish it. Yeah, it looks like something from underwater. <laughs> yeah. Like an alien. I would not want this like cr cr crawling on me. Oh my god! Uh, uh, totally gonna freak out. Totally gonna freak out. All right, all right. Thanks all everyone right. for indulging us. Okay, I'm okay. gonna lower everyone's hands now. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right, so uh, those were all good bugs. Those were all our friends. Uh, so hey, I know they look strange. Um, sometimes insects look strange, but let's meet our garden friends. All right, so lady beetles, we all know about the lady beetle, right? She gets the, she's pretty much the star of the show. Uh, we can always recognize the lady beetle or the lady bird beetle or lady bug. Those are all the names. There's over 450 species of lady beetles in North America. Their lifespan is going to be anywhere from three months to a year, and they will vary in color. And they're also vary in patterns and spots. So sometimes they can be all black with just a couple red spots. Sometimes they can be um, all red or all orangish red uh, with no spots or, you know, just a couple spots, lots of spots. Uh, ladybugs are predators of most small soft bodied insects. So that's, that's what their job is. They're out there um, just wanting to consume soft bodied insects, such as aphids, white fly nymphs, mealybugs, and so forth. Both the adult and the larvae have ferocious appetites and can consume hundreds of aphids. So Throughout the ladybug's entire lifespan, it can actually consume upwards of 5,000 um, soft-bodied insects, including aphids. So that's pretty tremendous. So just to share, whenever we've purchased ladybugs in the past, and we, because we think we've got a lot of um, aphids in our garden, and we release those ladybugs, they're looking for a lot of food. So that is one reason why a lot of them are going to fly away, because that you're, there's those 
handful of aphids, though it might be, look like hundreds on your plant, it is not enough for them. So adult lady uh, beetles will only stick around if food is present. So otherwise they're gonna, you know, go to your neighbor or see if they've got something yummy for them. Um, so we always want to provide a really nice habitat for them. We wanna uh, grow a nice uh, variety of flowering plants because the adult is also going to be feeding off of nectar and pollen, okay? So that's what's really important. And, uh, but they do like to have a lot of variety, including trees and shrubs, but they really, especially love flowers. So um, that's something to, uh, that's a little shout out about lady beetles. All right, this one, uh, about half of us wanted to smush it. So this is the ladybug larvae. They look like little alligators. Uh, they um, are pretty tiny. They also are going to vary in color as the adults do. They can be seen as all black or primarily black with bright orange spots or uh, stripes or red or even gray uh, spots or bands, okay? They will feed uh, through this stage of their life is going to be about two to four weeks uh, before they pupate. And uh, then a few days later, they'll emerge as an adult lady beetle. They can consume during this stage of their life, hundreds and hundreds of aphids. So I like to think of them as like the teenagers. They're just, their only job is to go out there and just eat other insects. So, um, and they're, you know, going to eat not only uh, aphids, which is their most favorite meal, but they're also going to eat scale insects, spider mites, insect eggs, um, white fly nymphs, um, and so forth. So they're really doing a great service to our garden. I love seeing them cruising around. All right, what the heck is this? This looks so weird. This is actually the lady beetle pupae. So you could see in a couple different shapes and forms how they're kind of you know, trans, um, transitioning from that larvae to this little dome shape. And um, this is, they'll, they'll be here for anywhere from um, about three to 15 days. And they will uh, then emerge as that adult lady beetle. Um, we see these attached to different types of surfaces throughout the garden, sometimes on the side of a terracotta or glazed pot. Uh, in this case, it's on the leaf of a plant. And that um, picture on the right is actually a bamboo stake in one of my raised beds. So they're all around. So um, it's just kind of fun to see them. And then these, these are the eggs. So I like to show the eggs of the ladybugs because they're very specific. They definitely stand out because they're this bright golden yellow. And um, the eggs are gonna get, the adults are gonna lay eggs in clusters of uh, anywhere as little as three or five and upwards to like 30. I usually see clutches of about you know 20 or so, but in that first picture, uh, a few slides back, there that was a nice clutch. Um, they are golden yellow football shaped, uh, placed up on their point. So very specific. When you see these, you absolutely know that they are uh, ladybug eggs. And understand that a single adult female can lay more than a thousand eggs during her lifespan. Um, and then they will emerge as the larvae uh, within two to five days. Isn't that cool? All right. So who's this friend? A lot of us recognize this green lacewing. We might recognize them as the clear winged in insect that flies or flutters around the porch light at night. They feed on pollen. Uh, they want flower nectar uh, and the pollen and anything sweet that is going to be out there around those flowers. Uh, they'll also feed off the honeydew that the aphids secrete and the other uh, honeydew of other insects. Um, however, they are strictly just going to be eating uh, pollen and flower nectar. So they're actually an important pollinator in the garden. Depending on the weather conditions and the season, the adult will live four to six weeks. All right, remember this creepy crawler? This guy is the lacewing larvae is uh, otherwise no other other um, also known as the aphid lion. Uh, the larvae, um, I'm sorry, this larvae is a predator. He is uh, definitely just on the hunt for food. 
they're very, very tiny, anywhere from three eighths of an inch to half an inch. So about the size of two, the length of two aphids uh, front to back. So if you were to line up two aphids, that's about the size of the lacewing larvae. You think that they're so small that you wouldn't see them, but believe it or not, they're quite, uh, it's quite remarkable that you can see them, recognize them. And let me tell you, they do not wanna bite you. They don't wanna puncture you, nothing. But they are out there feasting on aphids and thrips and mites and mealybugs, white fly nymphs, small caterpillars, insect eggs, and other soft-bodied pests. They will eat hundreds, um, hundreds, hundreds uh, through their lifespan. When they're in this stage, they're going to be in this larval stage from about two to three weeks. And they like to eat about one insect per minute when they're active. So these guys, when I see that lacewing in my garden, I get really excited because that means if my garden is inviting enough with a lot of flowers, and if I've got food for the young to eat, I'm going to have some lacewing larvae cruising around. Um, after their two to three uh, week lifespan, they're going to spin a little silken white cocoon. And then after five days, the adult lacewing will emerge. All right. Has anyone seen these in their garden? This looks really strange. These are actually the lacewing eggs. These are oval, white, pale green on a quarter inch slender stalk, which keeps uh, the egg is suspended on this slender stalk. And the reason why it's suspended is because those larvae, the lacewing larvae, those aphid lions, have such uh, amazing appetites that the minute they hatch, if the eggs were all lined up next to each other, just like those ladybug eggs, the first one that hatched would eat all the other eggs. So uh, this is just remarkable. Um, so the adult when it lays, it's when she lays her eggs are on these little slender stalks. So when that um, young larvae hatches, it has to walk down that stalk and then it can start on the hunt, which is super cool. Flowers that the lace wings love will include anything from the carrot or aster family. So that's going to be flowers like dill, cilantro, parsley, um, and yes, dill, cilantro, and parsley are all herbs that I let go to flower because when I let them go to flower, you will see beneficial insects swarming these flowers. It is really fun. But also asters, goldenrods, and sunflowers are going to be some of their favorites. Okay, here's another picture of the lacewing eggs um, when we're at a um, educational um, uh, program up uh, near Davis. We were on a, in, a beneficial insect bug hunt and we got to see these guys and it was pretty fun. All right, so this friend, this is going to be our surfed fly, also known as hoverfly or flower fly. This is not a bee uh, and it's also not a wasp, uh, though it has stripes, it is a true fly. They don't sting, they don't swarm. They have um, just developed this defense mechanism to look like a bee or a wasp so that birds don't eat them, which is really cool. They will actually dart around the garden like a helicopter to, and they are out there pollinating our flowers. So you'll see them out on flowers, pollinating them, and then you'll see them just kind of buzz and kind of stay still and then dart over here and buzz and stay still, really just like a helicopter. That's one reason why one of their names is hoverfly. There's nearly 900 species of flower flies throughout North America. They do come in a lot of different uh, sizes, uh, very, very tiny, about an eighth of an inch, all the way up to about a half an inch. So even in your own garden, you'll see different species of the hoverflies or these flower flies in your own garden. The adults feed on the nectar and pollen. Uh, they are very important pollinators, as I mentioned. They are, uh, they do live around the world except for Antarctica. And their favorite flowers are sweet alyssum, though sweet alyssum is on the invasive plant list. So if we are planting it in our gardens, be careful that it is not going to migrate beyond the areas we have it planted. Yarrow is another wonderful uh, favorite plant of theirs. Catmint or nepeta, the California native buckwheat, and then cilantro and parsley are also going to be their faves. All right, so there, here are a couple photos. You might see this is kind of a 
you know, up close. This is actually the larvae of the surfeit fly. So they're legless and worm-like. So because it's a true fly, the adult, their larvae is considered a maggot, not a word we always like to use, right? But in this case, uh, very beneficial. He, uh, this guy is gonna be the only one that's out there that's, um, they can range in color from like a limey kind of leaf green to kind of a khaki tan. And there is the only one that's gonna have a racing stripe down its back. So that is your indicator. If you're out there, I plant them around my roses, and then I let the aphids uh, live on my roses. I get really excited when aphids arrive because then I know that if there's aphids on my roses, that hoverfly is going to lay eggs, and then there's larvae is going to be there within a few days eating those aphids. So I don't panic. Okay, so that is a good thing. So I get out there and I hunt and I look around. They also prey on scale insects, thrips, mites, but their favorite again is aphids. And a single larvae can eat hundreds of soft bodied insects throughout its, uh, this, this stage of their life. All right, so this also looks kind of weird. These are the cervid fly eggs. So uh, the picture on the left, you might not see very well, but uh, there are some close-ups. The females will always lay this whitish gray oblong rice-like, it's kind of a rice-shaped egg, uh, singly. So it's just going to be singly uh, next to, or usually very close to aphids or other food. So that when that uh, egg hatches, the larvae already has a, a feast, right? in close proximity. So um, again, I mentioned some of the favorite flowers, uh, but you know, again, when we can have a variety of flowers, especially flowers that are clusters of tiny, you know, little flowers together, like that nepeta, like the dill, like the parsley, we're gonna see more of these, the activity. And the entire uh, life cycle of egg to adult is going to be two to four weeks. All right. Remember that um, very strange insect that we saw, the last one? It's a mealybug destroyer. And this is what's so cool, is I got to see them in my garden. Uh, I've been teaching this program for years and I just got to see, I'm all, I've seen all of these insects now in my garden and it is really fun. So I encourage you all to get out and uh, go for some good bug hunts, but enough of that. This is the main predator of mealybugs, but, they will also eat aphids and soft scale insects, okay? The adults are very, very, very tiny. The adults, which is a lady beetle, okay, is just gonna be a sixth of an inch, very tiny. But the larvae can grow up to about half an inch, twice the size of an adult mealybug, okay? So they're fast feeding, highly mobile ladybird beagle, beetles that actively seek out mealybugs. Uh, they do move fast. They can consume upwards of 250 mealybugs within, throughout their lifespan. And both the adult and the larvae are going to be uh, predatory and definitely reduce the need for pesticides. So um, it's hard to believe sometimes we've got mealybugs on our plants, but if we can just hold off and uh, invite them in, uh, then we're going to see those populations of mealybugs and other pests drop substantially. So um, other thing I wanted to share is that the adults, uh, she can lay over 400 eggs during her two month lifespan. And um, sad news is, is that because the mealybug destroyer um, larvae look so much like a mealybug, they're often um, mistaken to be the pest as well. So sometimes they are targeted with a pesticide, but um, because they look like so similar to a mealybug, the mealybugs don't recognize them. So that's how they can come and sneak up on their prey. So it's fascinating how, uh, um, I don't know, how smart they are. Let's just say that. All right, here's a picture of mealybug uh, uh, destroyers in my garden with some ladybug larvae all out there cruising around eating some aphids, a lot of fun. All right. And then this is when things really go into the science fiction category, sci-fi. I, I, I really believe that all beneficial insects are, we're just really the, the, um, 
the inspiration for a lot of sci-fi films. Anyway, these are parasitoids or parasitic wasps uh, and other, there's parasitic uh, flies um, out there as well, but this is, we're gonna focus on the parasitoids, uh, parasitic wasps right now. And the parasitic wasps, these are wasps that live part of their lives as parasites inside or on insects, their hosts, the food they wanna eat. I know it's really weird. There are several hundred species of these wasps. They are, uh, this is a very large group and they um, really vary in size and color, but I will assure you they're all very tiny. In fact, we mistake them as sometimes a fungus gnat or fruit fly or something very, very, very tiny. They can range from brown to black to kind of tannish black and so forth. And um, they do not bite, they do not sting, they do not swarm, they don't bother anything. They are out there pollinating and uh, managing pest insects for us. So they are excellent at controlling aphids, scale insects, leaf miners, leaf hoppers, caterpillars, roaches, flies, beetles, white flies, even ticks, and the list goes on. So these guys are play, paying a tremendous service to us. Here is a really cool picture. Okay, the picture on the right, this was, I was working at a store uh, um, and a customer came in and was asking, what the heck is this on her little cutting of a camellia leaf? Well, the manager knew I was there working and he got really excited to show me that these are the mummies, uh, so of aphids. So what happens is, is that um, the illustration in the photo is a close up picture of the wasp laying an egg inside an aphid. When that egg hatches inside that aphid, the larvae will then consume the inside of the aphid, leaving the outer skin as a puffed up shell. And then it cuts a perfectly round hole to exit out of. And then it emerges as an adult wasp. So uh, this is why uh, where I was mentioning sci-fi, because this is where uh, that movie, um, 1986, that movie Aliens with Sigourney Weaver, it, it was inspired by this exact insect. Isn't that wild? All right. Soldier beetles are super popular. They're super common. We're going to see them uh, cruising around already. They're one of the first to emerge. They're about a half inch. They are related to fireflies, but they don't have that light producing organ. So uh, they're out there. Oftentimes they're mistaken as a pest, but they are out there enjoying the flower nectar, the flower pollen. Um, and they're also eating some soft bodied insects, but they are really important pollinators. Um, they're also going to eat um, a Aphids, small caterpillars, um, you know, other um, scale insects, thrips, and so forth. But they're really out there just cruising around the garden, enjoying some pollen, enjoying some, you know, a little protein snack. Um, so we're going to let them cruise around and do their thing. Their larvae, uh, we typically don't see the larvae actually is going to be living in the soil the whole time. It looks again, like one of those little mini alligators. It's typically a very dark color, like all uh, like kind of a dark brown or black, and they're going to be about three quarters of an inch. Um, uh, and they're actually in the soil, the top couple, like inch of soil, feeding on ground dwelling uh, insects and ground dwell like any larvae that overwintered or eggs that are in the soil. So they're actually doing us a great service as well. Um, so it's always a treat to see them. Okay, and dragonflies, I just like to, you know, I feel like I've, I kind of forget about how important they are. We don't always see them until we're on a hike or maybe cruising around a really nice uh, nature area. And then a nice, large, beautiful dragonfly comes cruising through. Uh, they live in marshy areas, ponds, lakes, and creeks. Uh, they start as tiny eggs, the size of a dot at the end of a period, if you're typing, um, you know, a sentence out. They scatter their eggs freely over the waterways or they'll tuck them into vegetation that is floating in the water or in the muddy stream bottoms. So um, they'll either ha hatch within a few weeks or over winter before hatching. But the eggs, they hatch uh, from eggs, they hatch into nymphs. And those nymphs uh, can actually be in the water up to two years before they emerge as, as an adult. Um, dragonfly. And then the adult is going to live for several weeks. But 
they are super important because during this time as an adult, they are feeding on hundreds of small flying insects, such as mosquitoes, gnats, flies, and other small flying insects. They actually have their legs actually look a little bit like a basketball hoop. And as they're flying, they just catch it in their legs, the like little hoop, and then um, the little basket, and then they just pop it in their mouth like popcorn. And um, it's pretty fun. I love them. They can, uh, their feeding range is actually three miles from their home. So they're going to be cruising a very large region, a very large area of space looking for food. And they are going to be able to consume hundreds of these insects during their lifetime. But because they uh, live so much, a big part of their life is in the water, um, it's, a, it's really important to be mindful of the types of products we use because any products that are toxic to the waterways are actually going to have adverse effects on our dragonfly larvae. Spiders, I'm really sorry for any of you that are scared of spiders. I know that is a real thing. I will tell you that I get really a little eked out, um, especially in the fall when the spider webs really start coming on strong and you're working in a garden. You know, we kind of have to, us gardeners learn, we have to walk through gardens like this just to get the webs away, right, Charlotte? Anyway, uh, all spiders are um, predaceous. They are eating mainly insects or other spiders. Um, and I will share that they are um, going to the common garden spiders are not web weavers. You see these two pictures of crab spiders on flowers in my garden. They're almost translucent. They do like to hide the, you know, spiders are very afraid of us. We're big. Uh, we have the uh, potential to squish them. They know this. Uh, so they really like to stay out of sight. Um, but garden spiders, flower spiders, are going to typically be at the base of flowers or the base of the plant, waiting for insects, their food, any food to come along so they can kind of pounce on it and eat it. Um, there are then web weavers, those web weaving spiders. Okay, those are also really cool. And um, they wait for their food to fly into the web or to find uh, a way to come into the web. So they are um, the most beneficial insect globally because they are consuming so many other insects. They are really keeping insects in balance. So spiders, though, we might be really afraid of them, and I get that. If there is a way that we can kind of try to have some tolerance, just let them do their thing, stay out of our way, because they're out there uh, paying us, a, they're just doing a tremendous service for us in the garden. All right, and then this is another weird one, beneficial nematodes. Uh, so beneficial nematodes are um, microscopic worm-like organisms that naturally live in the soil. So we never see them. Okay. And in fact, we wouldn't be able to see them because you need a microscope. Uh, but you might purchase them because they're excellent at seeking out and destroying over 200 soil dwelling insects, including lawn grubs, flea larvae, cutworms, weevils, fungus gnats, um, the fungus gnat larvae, termites, and, uh, and, and so more, so many more. There's three unique species that are available for retail purchase. You can, um, you know, talk to your local garden center about them. Each of the species of nematodes pr prefer specific prey. Um, so you want to always make sure you're getting the correct type uh, for the pest problem that you have. But in this case, um, the photo on the right is actually uh, uh, beneficial nematodes feeding um, and attacking uh, fungus gnat larvae. So if a fungus gnat larvae is is small, I mean, really, really small. You can imagine now the beneficial nematodes are even smaller, but they work tremendously well. I've personally used them for problems I've had in my garden and it's always impressive because it almost seems like you're applying something invisible, but they are, they are really doing a great job for us. And then our bees, um, uh, as well as, uh, you know, European honeybees, um, we have our native bees, they're going to be under categories of either social or solitary bees. There's over um, for most of, sorry, uh, over 4,000 species of native bees are, um, are, we'll see throughout North America, and there's going to be 1,600 in California. 
And there's going to be um, 90 specific species of bees here in um, throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Pardon me. So over 4,000 species of native bees throughout North America. Um, we are lucky to have 1,600 species of native bees throughout California, and then 90 specific uh, species of native bees throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so it's not just the European honeybee. A lot of the bees we see in the garden are actually native bees. 30% of the bees that we're going to see in the garden are actually tunnel or cavity nesters. So we might find them in stalks of uh, or stems of flowers from last year, some of our perennials, we may be deadheaded them, but we left the stem. If you look inside that stem before you cut it to the ground, you might see that's been packed with um, some filling. And that is evidence that a native bee laid an egg, filled that cavity with a little bit of pollen and then packed it and we're waiting for the young to emerge. Um, so then the 70% of our native bees are going to be ground dwellers, taking advantage of any abandoned ground beetle nests or dwellings. Or, and then some of our ground um, dwelling or ground nesting bees are capable of actually digging out the soil. So that's kind of fun. Um, oftentimes when I'm at like cliffs on the coast, there are um, some species of native bees that are cliff dwellers, or there's, they're just in the soil out at the coast, which is really cool. So it's fascinating to watch. So we always uh, will, we're big advocates for putting mulch and protecting your soil with mulch, but because of the native bees, we always want to leave a section of the garden that's um, ungroomed, uncultivated, and bare, that has bare soil so that we can support our ground nesting bees. Awesome. Wow. Thank you, Suzanne. That was so much information about our friends, our, our beneficials in the garden, our garden allies. Um, so thank you for sharing with you know, uh, how these natural enemies help us. Now we're going to talk about how to invite them in and keep them around our gardens longer. Um, so when we think about inviting our natural enemies, we're going to think of the three Ps, predators, parasites, and pollinators. And as Suzanne mentioned, you can go to the next slide. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, of course, they eat lots of garden pests and that's what we want them to do. But it, their diet is not only made out of garden pests, many of them also require pollen and nectar from flowers. So um, what we wanna do is make sure we provide a variety of flowers for them to feed off of and get that nectar and pollen from as well. And flowers that we like to, they like that like they are most attracted to, they kind of fall into two groups, flowers that look like daisies or are daisies, asters, um, or are like sunflowers, kind of with that button in the middle and the ray of petals around. So here's a short list with cosmos, asters, coreopsis, echinacea, all great options to add add to uh, the, the garden. And then another kind of group that really attracts the beneficials is flowers that have, uh, that grow in clusters of tiny flowers. And so that could be yarrow, uh, the sweet alyssum that uh, Suzanne mentioned, ceanothus, which is totally popping right now. I'm a big ceanothus fan, so I love it. Um, but even our herbs, lavender, oregano, mint, all uh, parsley can produce some nice tiny flowers for those beneficial insects. And you can learn more about the different kinds of flowers that they like at the, of course, the Our Water World website. We have a healthy gardens fact sheet, and we also have a uh, handout called 10 Most Wanted Bugs in the Garden, which we'll talk about 10 uh, common bugs, which we touched on most of them today, um, where you'll find them in the garden, what they eat, what they, uh, what attracts them and what plants we can plant to attract them. The UC Master Gardeners program, a great resource for, for plants, for beneficial insects. And of course the California Native Plant Society will also list specific ones for, um, for attracting beneficials. 
So what else are we gonna do in the garden for the good bugs? Uh, well, as I mentioned, we're gonna plant a variety of flowering trees, shrubs, perennials, plants of all sizes, tall, low ground covers, just more variety will attract more variety of bugs. Um, then we're gonna let them, some flowers go to seed. We're not gonna deadhead all of them. Let them go to seed, that'll attract birds as well. It'll provide nesting material for birds and these beneficial insects. We're gonna use um, a chunky arbor wood mulch to provide shelter for many good insects. Now you don't need the whole you know, yard mulch with this chunky wood, but at least add some areas where there's that, um, that wood for shelter. And then yes, if you can leave an area of the garden uncultivated and bare for the ground nesting bees, that's gonna be really important. Just maybe in the back corner where you don't go very often, uh, you don't need to worry about it just, um, and you won't have to stare at your bare ground very often, but uh, it is good to uh, leave that small area. And then also we can offer a water source. So we think of bird baths. Of course, we wanna offer water for our birds during the hot, dry months, but the pollinators need, or the beneficials, the natural enemies also need uh, water. So we can create what's called like a bee bath, which will help bees, but also other pollinators and predators. So it's just a shallow, you can see that picture on the right, a shallow dish with some rocks in it and fill it up with some water so they can land on the rocks and take a little drink of water. It's gonna be really helpful once, you know, it find, it's starting to dry out now already, um, might get a little bit more rain, but it's gonna be dry quite quickly. And then of course, later in the, the summer, those uh, insects are definitely gonna be looking for some water. And uh, very importantly, we are going to reduce or avoid pesticides. We really want to share that pesticides don't solve the pest problem. Yes, they do kill pests quite effectively, but they also kill lots of other things. And you know, you could you could spray and kill the pest, but there's usually a reason why pests are attracted to plants. Um, yes, some some pests are seasonal and expected, but there is usually a reason why pests are on your plants. So you got to figure out why. So yes, some pests are seasonal and expected. Right now is like prime aphid season. It's warming up. There's lots of new growth on the plants. That's gonna attract a lot of aphids. Very common, expected. We're gonna monitor, look out for them. Um, and then some, and then of course we're gonna remember as we've talked about this whole evening, pests are food for beneficials and they help keep healthy balance. So we want to make sure that we're not, we can't kill everything. If we kill everything, we're not gonna have our good bugs either. We want some level of tolerance of these pests so that we'll invite in those good bugs, those beneficials. And as I was mentioning previously, oh, sorry, go back to the last slide. Uh, just a reminder that an infestation of a pest can be a clue that something is not working or that a plant is stressed out. So we need to address that cause or else the pest problem will never go away no matter how much we spray, especially if we spray a lot. All right, and then the first step in pest management, as I mentioned at the beginning, is identification. Identify the pest. Uh, we're gonna make sure we know we're looking at a pest or a good bug, or maybe not a pest at all, No, not even a bug at all. It's maybe our watering or our fertilizing. We need to identify. And then of course, definitely before we spray or grab a pesticide, we're gonna identify what we're looking at because all pests require, all bugs require different modes of action. And we wanna choose the most appropriate for that pest if we are gonna try to get rid of it. Uh, we're gonna identify the pest. We're gonna understand its life cycle. Understanding the life cycle will help us be more effective at at uh, getting rid of it, uh, understand the habitat and timing when it's gonna show up. And of course we wanna know, are there natural enemies of that pest? And if so, are they in our garden and how can we get them into our garden? And I just wanted to share again, a, a reason why identification is so important. There's the monarch butterfly larva caterpillar on the right, the black one with yellow and white stripes very similar green with yellow and black stripes. On the left is a um, the larva of a hummingbird moth. Now, 
And that's not to say that the hummingbird moth is a pest. Some people find the caterpillar, the larva of the honey, hummingbird moth, the caterpillar to be a pest because they do eat plants, but we also are gonna rethink, this goes back to our thresholds. We're gonna rethink our approach because yes, it will eat some of our plants, but once it turns into a moth, it's gonna be a wonderful pollinator. So kind of really understanding uh, if we are gonna kill something, why we're doing that, what are the costs and benefits of that? Again, some more lookalikes, uh, squish or not squish. <laughs> There's the mealybug destroyer on the left, um, considered a good bug, and the flea beetle on the right, considered a bad bug, looking very similar. Another group, the damsel bug, considered a good bug. And on the right, leaf-footed bug, considered a bad bug for uh, tomatoes and pomegranates. And then last one, on the left, we showed you the ladybug pupa before, so we definitely want to uh, not squish that one. Uh, definitely a good bug and looks very similar to soft scale. This these pictures actually came from the same tree. Um, someone who attended a webinar uh, several months ago sent us these photos. Same tree, two totally different bugs. Uh, one is good and one is considered a pest. All right. And then when we do, if we do choose to use pesticides, we're always using them as a last resort. We're going to go through all of our IPM strategies before we reach for the pesticide. We're going to use less toxic and most eco-friendly available to us. Um, and when we say eco-friendly, we usually mean uh, safest for waterways, won't cause harm to the waterways, breaks down quickly in the environment. But we're always going to apply the pesticide according to the label. This is extremely important. Even eco-friendlies applied incorrectly can be quite harmful uh, to ourselves, the environment, to good bugs. So really read the label, mix properly if needed, um, and uh, read all the instructions before you even buy it. And because it also lists another reason why we want to identify our pests before we buy a pesticide is because uh, Pesticide label will always list the pests that it kills. So if our pest is not on that label, we're not going to use that product. We're also always going to use our peep, wear our PPE, long sleeves, long pants, uh, gloves, face covering, eye covering. Be really careful. Even eco-friendlies can cause harm to our skin, our eyes, our lungs. So we want to be really careful. And we're going to understand the risks of using pesticides, not only to um, ourselves or the environment, but to the good bugs in the garden. And then speaking of uh, risks to the environment, we really want to avoid products that contain neonicotinoids on the label. And so you can read the active ingredients. Um, neonicotinoids, you're not going to see that word on the label, but they're a group of chemicals. Um, and we have a list of common ones on the right. Um, Amida culprit, the almost at the bottom, is very common um, in a lot of products. So we're going to look for those names and avoid them when possible. They're very often um, they're used, they're, they're used as systemic pesticides, which means we water them in uh, into the soil, they get absorbed by the roots, and they move throughout the plant's entire vascular system, tissue, even through to its flowers and pollen. And um, it can, it's often used for like aphids, beetles, diseases, um, but when these good bugs, these pollinators come to the plant and take the pollen or the nectar from these flowers, they absorb the, the uh, systemic pesticide and it can really harm them and kill potentially kill them. Uh, neonicotinoids um, are, is linked to colony collapse in bees. So this is one of the reasons we really want to avoid these products. Um, and neonicotinoids can remain active in the soil, in the plants, up to three years. And something I didn't mention earlier, but also like, you know, say you're, we're using it on one plant, but what we're doing is we're watering it into the soil. Uh, so it's, you know, the soil doesn't have boundaries underneath there, so it can move to other plants as well. Um, and it could potentially harm any bees that come to any flowers in your garden because it's going to move throughout the soil, through the water, um, and 
uh, could harm bees through the other um, the other plants, the unintended plants that you don't want, <laughs> you didn't intend to be treated with this product. Um, yes, and then so also if you're interested in, you know, being careful about bees and understanding the impacts pesticides do have on the bee population, the UCIPM website has um, a really great tool. Um, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure every they list pesticides. You can look up a lot of different kinds of pesticides on their website, and they will all have a kind of bee precaution rating how potentially harmful that pesticide is to bees. Um, so I do recommend looking that up before we're using them in the garden. And then some more resources for you. These are on the uh, sheet that Suzanne sent out earlier in a email. But of course, the Our Water, Our World website, ourwaterourworld.org, common pest problems, and talking about water quality and other less toxic products. Um, the UC IPM program. So you usually we usually talk about this as like pest ID, a uh, great way to deal manage pests. But I did want to share that they also have a wonderful section on these beneficial predators, these natural enemies in the garden. So we can still we can learn about the good bugs on that website as well. Um, Bugguide.net, another great way to help with identifying bugs. I know someone asked earlier about. Um, what are the bad bugs? So we're gonna we're gonna identify the bugs, both good and bad, using these tools. And then when we want to learn more about pesticides, we can go to the National Pesticide Information Center. It has very readable explanations of how common pesticides work in the garden. And then here's a nice picture of a surfed fly on Suzanne's thumb, another wonderful, she loves these surfed flies, so they just love her too. Um, and a lovely quote, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it's hitched to everything else in the universe. Um, and that's definitely the case in our gardens. And with that, I'll just say thank you for joining us this evening. Wow, right on time tonight, pretty good. 